Greetings to all our brethren and friends around the world. Today we'll be studying one of the most controversial subjects among Christians, as well as among Advent people of God. It is entitled, Marriage, a Lifelong Tie. Tracing back the history in the Bible, we will find that the first celebrant was God, and the first couple that was married was between Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Let us read Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 to 28. In the beginning, God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he them. Father, in verse 28, And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. In verse 7 and 18 and 21 of chapter 2 of Genesis, it says, Father, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breath into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help me for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman, and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. As we read along the lines of these verses, we found out that God was the first celebrant and Adam and Eve was the first couple that was married. And we understand that as God was looking unto Adam, he was alone. While the animals have their uh, helpmate, they have their partners. But Adam was alone. That's why he caused Adam to sleep very deep. And out of the rib, one of his ribs, the Lord take one rib and form woman. And finally, Adam, when he woke up, he said, this is my bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh, and I will call her woman. And then the Lord celebrated the first marriage, and he said, therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they shall be one flesh. So the three elements of marriage will be living his father and mother, and number two, cleave to his wife, and number three will be one flesh. Therefore, as we consider here, in the beginning, God instituted marriage for the happiness of human family. The marriage was one of the first gifts of God to man. And it's one of the two institutions after the fall, Adam brought with him out of the paradise. Now, as we can see along the verses, we can see God's original plan. And also, God made the man and the woman, and they too were to become one. And it is interesting to note that there was no provision for divorce. We can see there that they should be one, and they should be one only, and they will not be separated. We can see the following reasons below. 
Number one, upon celebrating the first marriage ceremony, he said, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Genesis 2.24 Number one, cannot be divided by any number, only by itself, or else it will become a decimal. So, married couple also cannot be separated in their union or else it will go into a fragment. Because a couple, husband and wife, must be one. And if you divide one, it cannot be divided. So, a couple who are united into one, if we divide them, then it will go into a fragment. Jesus also said in Matthew 19 verse 6, when God joined together, let no man put asunder. It means no person has the right to break this union or else we are going against the plan of God. Apostle Paul also said in Romans 7 verse 2, For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. This means that the marriage relationship will only end till death of the partner. Now, it is really interesting to know that God's plan for marriage will be for life. But Satan is doing his utmost effort in destroying family. He's like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, according to 1 Peter 5 verse 8. One of his greatest attacks is now launched against the family. Everywhere we go, we see husbands and wives separating from each other and causing turmoil in the families. All this makes Satan very happy. Why? Because in this way, he is leading many to eternal ruin. Satan first introduced polygamy to the old inhabitants of this planet Earth. Even our heroes of faith were not exempted to fall in his snares. Like for example, Abraham took Hagar, even he was already married to Sarah. Jacob took Rachel, even he was already married to Leah. David was married to several women and has several concubines. Solomon has several wives and concubines. However, the Lord did not pass this sin unnoticed. The consequences of their sins were continually haunting on them and their children. Next, Satan introduced divorce and remarriage. It was introduced in the time of Moses because of the hardness of the head of God's people in the time. This terrible sin was practiced even in the time of Christ, even until today. God made a man and woman, and the two were to become one flesh. No provision was made for divorce in the beginning. But as usual, Satan had success in perverting this idea, even among God's people. Now, let us talk about the situation of marriage in Jesus' time. We can read in Adventist Home, page 341, paragraph 1. Jesus came to our world to rectify mistakes and to restore the moral image of God in man. Wrong sentiments in regard to marriage had found a place in the minds of the teachers of Israel. They were making of none effect the sacred institution of marriage. Man was becoming so hard-hearted that he would form most trivial excuses separate from his wife. Or if he chose, he would separate her from the children and send her away. It is really sad that in the time of Jesus Christ, in the time of the Israelites, the teachers of God's people have wrong concept about marriage. They were permitted to divorce and to remarry after divorce. And this brings sadness and sorrows for the children of that family. But do you think 
that Jesus permit divorce and separation in the union of the marriage? What do you think? Let us read Matthew 19, 3 to 4. Matthew chapter 19, verses 3 and 4. The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? And he said, For this cause shall a man leave the father and the mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and the twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore, they are no more twain but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. You know, when the Pharisees came to him, came to Jesus, asking him and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? You know, the liberal school of Hillel thought that a man might secure a divorce for the most trivial costs, such an example of permitting his food to burn. Then the husband will not be happy, he will be angry, and he can let the wife go out from the family. He can file a divorce because of that simple thing. But Jesus answered them, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart suffered to put away your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. In other words, Jesus answered them no to their question. Jesus was pointing them back to Eden where there was no separation, there was no divorce. But he continued further that there is only one rightful reason for divorce, and that is fornication and adultery. Let us read Matthew 5.32. But I say unto you, that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her, that is divorced, committeth adultery. Another verse in Matthew 19, verse 9, Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery, and whose married her which is put away, doth commit adultery. The King James Version used the word fornication in the original Greek word pornea, but pornea includes harlotry, adultery, and incest. It means infidelity of marriage vow. That's the only rightful reason for separation and divorce, according to Jesus. If there is a divorce caused by infidelity of the partner, do you, do you think is it rightful for the innocent party to remarry? Of course, Jesus gave the go signal that the person who is innocent can divorce, can separate from his or her partner. But the question is, is it lawful to remarry again, especially for the innocent party? Let us see. Mark 10, verses 2 to 12. Whosoever shall put away his wife and marry another committed adultery against her, and if a woman shall put away her husband and be married to another, she committed adultery. Luke 16, 17, and 18. And it is easier for heaven and the earth to pass than one title of the law to fail. Whosoever putteth away his wife and marrieth another, committeth adultery, and whosoever marrieth her that is put away from her husband, committeth adultery. You see here that when a man that divorces his wife and marries another, just like in the text in Mark, is considered the innocent spouse and his wife the guilty one. But it goes farther. It speaks about the innocent party where Mark kept silent. He is not in adultery 
as his wife, of course. But it clearly says that if he, the innocent party, marries again, he is committing adultery. And the wife, the guilty party, if she marries again, the man who marries her will commit adultery also. So both are considered to have an adulterous relationship. So according to this Bible text that we read a while ago, if one is divorced and then remarries, regardless of who is innocent or guilty, that person is committing adultery. In Matthew 5.32, it says here, But I say unto you, that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her that is divorced, committed adultery. How can we explain this verse? Here we have a man divorcing his wife. If he does this for any reason other than fornication or adultery, he is actually causing the woman to commit adultery. How is that? Why is it? Why he is causing, is causing the woman to commit adultery? Because when a person is dumped from a marriage relationship, they are easy to be a prey to others. They are looking for affection, and so on. They are found wanting to get married again. This goes for either the man or the woman, or it, it can be applied between man and woman. In either case, whoever marries the person divorced, whether because of adultery or any other reason, committed also adultery. Now, there is one verse in the Bible which seems to be giving right for remarriage which is found in Matthew 19, verse 9. Let us read. And I say unto you, Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her which is put away, doth commit adultery. Here we can see that the Bible is always in a total agreement with itself, even in this case, even in this particular verse. It is not hard to understand. It is very simple. We can notice in the last part of the verse, whoso married her which is put away, don't commit adultery. In all circumstances, whether the man divorced her because she had already committed adultery, or whether he himself is the guilty spouse, by divorcing her and marrying another, the second marriage before the first spouse's death is called adultery. What about the first part of the verse? Does it give uh, permission to remarry? It says her, And I say unto you, Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, commit adultery. Here it is very clear that the exception clause, except it be for fornication, gives permission only to divorce. Gives only permission for divorce, but not to remarry again. You know why? Because Jesus had already spoken in other verses of the Bible that the innocent party cannot remarry or else he will commit adultery. Now, let us consider a proposition which is similar to the statements of Matthew 19, verse 9, from a grammatical perspective. Let us read back again Matthew 19, verse 9. And I say unto you, Whosoever shall put away his wife, except for fornication, and shall marry another, committed adultery. And also married her which is put away, don't commit adultery. So it is very clear there that there is an exception clause. The exception clause is very important. Why? Because 
that clause which says except for fornication gives right for that person to put away his wife but not remarrying again now let us see another proposition which is similar to that verse in Matthew 19 verse 9 it says here whoever bears arms except for self-defense against wild beasts and kills a man commits murder here we can see also an exception clause which is except for self-defense against wild beasts is it legal to bear arms yes of course and what reason that you can carry arms or bear arms when for self-defense against wild beasts but do you think you have the right to kill a man no way so that exception clause only gives you the permission to kill animals wild beasts for self-defense but to kill a man that is homicide so far as we can see here those who try to understand and explain that the exception clause of Matthew 19 verse 9 will also give permission to remarry that is too much that is misunderstanding of Christ's statement now we don't have problem about the guilty partner because he is already in adultery but what concern more for us now is the what we call the innocent party what shall we do with the innocent party will he or she remain unmarried or will he be or she be remarried again instead of making our own decision our own interpretation of matthew 19 verse 9 let us ask the bible to clarify because the bible will explain itself let us ask apostle paul to explain what will happen to the innocent party okay let us read first corinthians 7 verse 10 and 11 and unto the married i command yet not i but the lord let not the wife depart from her husband but if she depart let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband and let not the husband put away his wife we can see here that there is only one option for the innocent party if there will be separation we cannot control it because of some circumstances especially infidelity of marriage vow then there will be separation of course but what was the words of the great apostle he said let her remain unmarried or be reconciled now how long the spouse is under her vow to her partner in the book romans 7 verses 1 and 3 know ye not brethren for i speak to them that know the law how that the law have dominion over a man as long as he liveth for the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth but if the husband be dead she is lost from the law of her husband so then if while her husband liveth she be married to another man she shall be called an adulteress but if her husband be dead she is free from that law so that she is no adulteress though she be married to another man so how long the spouse or the partner will be under the law under the vow of marriage it says here very clearly so long the partner is still alive so here we can understand that marriage is a lifelong tie because when we make a vow according to deuteronomy 23 verses 21 to 23 when thou shalt vow a vow unto the lord thy god thou shalt not slack to pay it for the Lord thy God will surely require it of thee, and it would be sin in thee. But if thou shalt forbear to vow 
it shall be no sin in thee. If a couple come to the point that they vow a vow, a marriage vow, then till death parts them. They are married to each other so long as life shall last. Now, there are some suppositions that uh, Sister Ellen White, during her time, she wrote some passage in the spirit of prophecy that seemingly giving permission, of course, for divorce first. And the second one is remarriage. How true it is? Now, one such case was later published in Selected Messages, Volume 2, pages 339-340, which seemingly justified our remarriage. But we will quote the full or actual letter as released in the book entitled Testimonies on Sexual Behavior, Adultery, and Divorce, pages 67 and 74. Let us read. In regard to the marriage of your daughter with Walter C., I see where you are troubled, but the marriage took place with your consent, and your daughter, knowing all about him, accepted him as her husband. And now I can see no reason why you should carry any burden over this matter. Your daughter loves Walter C., and it may be that this marriage is in the order of God in order that both Walter and your daughter may have a richer Christian experience and be built up where they are deficient. Walter did not put his wife away, she so left him and put him away and married another man. I see nothing in the scripture that forbids him to marry again in the Lord. He has a right to be to the affection of a woman who, knowing his physical defect, shall choose to give him her love. The time has come when a sterile condition is not the worst condition to be in. And further in uh, page 73, paragraph 3, I am truly sorry that you have taken upon yourself unnecessary burdens. Do you not see that in separating Walter and your daughter, you would create two evils instead of curing one? In this particular passage of the Spirit of Prophecy, it shows that living together with the second marriage of Walter and that woman is evil, and separating them is another evil. So Sister White was saying here that doing or taking decision for remarriage is an evil action. And separating them again is another evil. It also shows us, as did the writings of Moses, that this permission was given because of the hardness of their hearts. That this was one of the statutes that were not good. So meaning that the permission given by Sister White was not good because of the hardness of their hearts. However, before divorcing his first wife, a warning was given to him before he contracted the second marriage. Let us read. It is written in Volume 13, Manuscript Releases, page, page 296, paragraph 2 and 3. I cannot see what more can be done in this case, and I think that the only thing that you can do is to give up your wife. If she is thus determined not to live with you, both she and you would be most miserable to attempt it. And as she has fully and determinedly set her stakes, you can only shoulder your cross and show yourself a man. In regard to divorce, I am not prepared to say. She has had all the light that can I give her. And it is useless to keep this matter constantly before her when she is perfectly decided to follow her own judgment. Let us read further. You asked me if I thought if your wife left you that you should marry again. I would say that if one understanding all the circumstances should, 
choose to marry you. If you had not been married, I see no objections. But I am not fully prepared to give any judgment. Whether in Bible point of view, you could marry again. My mind is so fully occupied that it is not possible for me to consider this vexed question of marriage and divorces. I wish I could help you, but that I fear it is not possible. Here we see in the beginning of the, of the letter of Sister White, she wrote, it may be that this marriage is in the order of God. This even leaves the permission in doubt. Secondly, the above letter was written in August 26, 1895, but in 1907, less than 12 years later, they were already separated. Now, what was the advice of Sister White for his second wife, for which this permission was granted? Do you think Sister White has a good advice for her? Let us read Testimonies on Sexual Behavior, pages 74, paragraph 1, and page 75, paragraph 2. After the separate, in 1907, Sister White said, I cannot advise you to return back to Walter C. Unless you see decided changes in him. The Lord is not pleased with the ideas he has had in the past of what is due to a wife. At one time, I spoke very plainly to Walter in regard to his responsibilities to his wife. It is very clear to me that it would be a mistake for you to be united again while you, your love for him is quenched. He cannot make you happy and his views are changed. I feel very sad about this matter. I feel indeed sorry for Walter, but I cannot advise you to go to him against your judgment. I speak to you as candidly as I spoke to him, and it would be perilous for you to to again place yourself under his dictation. I had hope that he would change. Now we can see here, in spite of the fact that they made a happy beginning, but sadly the union ended in separation. In the year 1910, W.C. White, the son of Sister White, sent a letter to a relative requesting him and his wife to be the fat, to be a father and mother to Laura, who had been living in Colorado. Laura was the ex-wife of the second wife of Walter. W.C. White commented that she had separated from her husband and was now making a new life for herself, not wanting to remain under his control. So, Father, he said. It was better for her to work hard and suffer some hardship than to ask for financial aid from one who was so dictatorial and domineering. She also became convinced that for her spiritual welfare, it was better for her to be as much as possible separated from Walter. Now we can see here that the advice of Sister White were the same. It is not good once they were separated. Walter had that second marriage, but ended up in separation again. Then their advice is not to return back. Sister Watt advised the woman not to return back to her husband. And also, it is not good to suffer from consequences if they will return back. Does this historical picture present anything like that it, that it definitely was the will of God? Do you think the second marriage of Walter and Laura was the will of God? We can say that we must use this experience as recommendation that must grant divorce and remarriage. Can we say that? However, that experience between Walter and Laura is it is written for us for a warning. Volume 2 is the Bible commentary page 
1017, paragraph 3, when once a retrograde movement begins, no one can tell where it may end. Another statement from Sister White that seems to be recommending for remarriage. Adventist Home, 344, paragraph 2 and 3. A woman may be legally divorced from her husband by the laws of the land, and yet not divorced in the sight of God and according to the higher law. There is only one sin, which is adultery, which can place the husband or wife in a position where they can be free from the marriage vow in the sight of God. Although the laws of the land may grant a divorce, yet they are husband and wife still in the Bible light according to the laws of the land. Father, let us use uh, manuscript releases number 17, 156 to be clear with that person that Sister White had wrote. It says here, I saw that Sister Johnson as yet has no right to marry another man. But if she or any other woman should obtain a divorce legally on the ground that her husband was guilty of adultery, then she is free to be married to whom she chooses. Of course, it is very clear here that there is uh, there was a suggestion of having a permission to remarry again if the woman can secure a legal paper for divorce. For the ground of what? For the ground of infidelity or marriage vow. But do you think it is also applicable in our time? Let us analyze. The statement was written in the year 1863, most probably even before the Jar Conference was even organized. And because the statement I saw, many well-meaning Christians as well as Adventists as well as Reformers also think that this was given her invasion and we must take it as a basis of our doctrine. And if we will not take it as a doctrine, they, they will say, ah, you don't believe spiritual prophecy anymore because it is clearly a vision of, her, of Sister White. It is not her own a statement. It is given by God. Of course, it is very clear. She said, I saw. But do you think every word which is I saw will become a doctrine? What do you think, brethren? This will be true if we had no other comparisons, if we don't have any other statement from the spirit of prophecy. When the letter was written in 1863, you know what happened? The Advent people were still eating pork in the time. Let us see. Testimonies, Volume 1, uh, page 206, I saw that your views concerning swine's flesh would prove no injury if you have them to yourselves. But in your judgment and opinion, you have made this question a test, and your actions had plainly shown your faith in this matter. If God requires his people to abstain from the swine's flesh, we will convict them, he will convict them on the matter. He's just as willing to show his honest children their duty as to show their duty to the individuals upon whom he has not laid the burden of his work. If it is the duty of the church to abstain from swine's flesh, God will discover it to more than two or three. He will teach his church their duty. You see, in this period, Sister White said, and she said also, I saw. The word I saw there is not from her own idea. It was a vision given by God. But can we make this word I saw, especially in relation with eating pork or eating, eating swine's flesh, can be our doctrine today? Of course, no. Because later, eating pork was prohibited by the Lord through Sister White. Now, 
Do you think there will be another statement of Sister White that somehow will give us idea that there will be no more remarriage? And that person involved in that problem also failed in the Seventh Commandment. The other one was innocent and the other one was the guilty party. What was the advice of Sister White? Let us read. In regard to the case of the injured sister, A.G., we would say in reply to the question of that it is a feature in the cases of most who had been overtaken in sin, as her husband has, that they have no real sense of their validity. Some, however, do and are restored to the church but not till they have merited the confidence of the people of God by unqualified confessions and a period of sincere repentance. This case presents difficulties not found in some. And we would add only the following. Number one, in cases of violation of the seventh commandment, where the guilty party does not manifest true repentance, if the injured party can obtain a divorce, without making their own cases and that of their children, if they have them, worse by so doing, they should be free. If they would be liable to place themselves and their children in worse condition by a divorce, we know of no scripture that would make the innocent party guilty by remaining. Number three, time and labor and prayer and patience and faith and a godly life might work a reform to live one to live with one who has broken the marriage vows and is covered all over with the disgrace and shame of the guilty love and realizes it not is an eating conquer to the soul and yet a divorce is a lifelong heartfelt sore god pity the innocent party marriage should be considered well before contracted number four why, oh why, will men and women who might be respectable and good and rich heaven at last sell themselves to the devil so cheap, warn their bosom friends, disgrace their families, bring a reproach upon the coast, and go to hell at last? God have mercy. Why will not those who are overtaken in crime manifest repentance? proportionate to the enormity of their crime and fly to Christ for mercy and heal as far as possible the wounds they have made? Number five, but if they will not do as they should, and if the innocent have forfeited the legal right to a divorce by living with the guilty after his guilt is known, we do not see that sin rests upon the innocent in remaining and her moral right in departing seems questionable if her health and life be not greatly endangered in so remaining. So here, the statement was written in 1868 and published in March 24 in the Review and Herald magazine. Upon analyzing these paragraphs very carefully, we can understand that in this passage, Sister White is now very determined to advise not to remarry again when there is divorce, especially because of infidelity of the partner. In this very time, my beloved friends and brethren, when the family is constantly attacked, God has his messengers working to avert his impending judgments. The Lord said in Malachi 4, 5, Behold, I will send you, Elijah the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. In these verses, God has prophesied that before he comes again, those who are represented by faithful Elijah will do a work in restoring the family. 
relationship between father and mother, husband and wife, relationship between children and parents. Who are these people that will represent faithful Elijah? The spread of prophecy will help us to identify the modern people in our time. Testimonies, Volume 3, page 62, paragraph 1. Those who are to prepare the way for the second coming of Christ are represented by faithful Elijah. As John came in the spirit of Elijah to prepare the way for Christ's first advent. We can see here, my beloved friends, those who will represent Elijah and John the Baptist are the faithful remnant people of God today. As God's remnant people, we should not be fearful if we meet with ridicule because of our stand against breaking up the families. We should stand as flint when we are opposed to remarriages, as John was beheaded because of his stand. Um, of course, we can read in Jeremiah 6, verse 16, the Lord is calling us to look for the old paths. He said, Stand ye in the ways and see and ask for the old paths, where is the good way, and walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, We will not walk therein. As far as we know, we have the bill of divorce, in the Old Testament, in the time of Moses. But Jeremiah was commanded by the Lord to send this message for us today. Let us look for what? The oldest paths. And we shall ask, where is the good way? And not only asking, we must walk therein. And once we walk therein, we will find rest for our souls. But what will be the reaction of many people? They said, we will not walk therein. As far as we know, that one of these old paths was the institution of marriage. In practicing according to the plan of God in marriage, which was no divorcement and remarrying, all families will find peace and rest in their souls. Mount of Blessing 64, but like every other one of God's good gifts entrusted to the keeping of humanity, marriage has been perverted by sin, but it is the purpose of the gospel to restore its purity and beauty. Spiritual prophecy calls our attention to this very work, which was not completed in the days of Sister White. She insists in Prophet and King 678, in the time of the end, every divine institution is to be restored. One of these institutions was the family relationship, was the marriage between man and a woman. And this will be restored by the remnant people of God today. Although it was not fully restored in the time of Ellen G. White, but for the final remnant church of God, this will be our greatest work. Not to have divorce easily, but if there, there will be a reason for divorce, especially for infidelity of marriage vow, then there will be divorce, but there will be no remarrying. Not the blessing 65 paragraph. One says, the grace of Christ and this alone can make, make this institution what God designed it should be, an agent for the blessing and uplifting of humanity. And thus the families of earth in their unity and peace and love may represent the family of heaven. May the Lord bless us and give us right understanding and that our family relationship between our husband and our wife will be in accordance to the will of God. This is my wish and prayer. Amen.